Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe that today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be part of. We hope to see you this Sunday morning here at City Life. Movies are wonderful, and uh, I really like movies. And one of my favorite things about movies is um, discovering the truth that you can find in certain movies. Some movies is a little harder to find than others. <laughs> you watch a movie, you're like, I don't know if there's anything Jesus I can take out of this. But sometimes you see a movie, and it's just like, wow, like that is, that is so applicable in my life. And that's what we're going to do today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a movie because Jesus loved to tell stories loved to tell stories all the time, and he would use those to point people towards spiritual truth. And so we're going to do the same thing today with a movie based on a true story. How many people love a good true story? Yeah. I think it's just way more impacting when you know yeah. this actually happened. And so today's true story is of a World War II medic named Desmond Doss, and the movie's called Hacksaw Ridge. Take a look at the trailer. I always dreamed about being a doctor, but I uh, didn't get much school. I can't stay here while all them go fight for me. But you figure this war is just going to fit in with your ideas? While everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving it. And that's going to be my way to serve. This is a personal gift from the United States government designed to bring death to the enemy. Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant. I can't touch a gun. She don't kill. No, sir. You know, quite a bit of killing does occur in war. Private Doss does not believe in violence. Do not look to him to save you on the battlefield. I don't think this is a question of religion. I think this is cowardice. I fell in love with you because you weren't like anyone else. You're saying you could go to prison. But I don't know how I'm going to live with myself if I don't stay true to what I believe. With the world so set on tearing itself apart, doesn't seem like such a bad thing to me to want to put a little bit of it back together. So that's only part of the trailer. I didn't want to give too much away yet, but uh, who, who has actually seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge? Oh, okay, more than in the last service. Interesting. Okay. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's awesome. It's really good. Uh, and it's powerful. And so today we're going we're gonna to take some truths that are found in this message. And honestly, this is probably one of the easiest messages to, to take and be like, wow, like this was so blatantly obvious in the movie, but I'm really excited to flesh this out and apply it to all of our lives today. So if you've never heard of Desmond Doss or if you haven't seen a movie, uh, this is Desmond Doss. Uh, he was a conscientious objector, which means an individual who has claimed the right to refuse to perform military service on the grounds of freedom of thought, conscience, or religion. So Desmond had a very strong stance against violence with guns that he developed at an early age uh, on his wall in his house. Uh, they, were, they were a family of faith. They had the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. He looked at that every day. And uh, his house, was, even though it was maybe built on faith, was a lot of messed up stuff going on there. And uh, his father had a gun, was going to use it on a family member. And if Desmond hadn't got involved, uh, things would have gone very bad. But so Desmond just made the choice. He's like, I will never touch a gun. And so he had a very strong conviction about this. And yet when war breaks out, Desmond still enlists because he wants to go and serve his country and help people however he can, even though he, his religious convictions don't allow him to kill. And he is eventually allowed to serve as a medic going into the battle unarmed, which is crazy. This really happened. At the end of his story, he receives a Congressional Medal of Honor, which is the highest award for courage under fire but we'll get to that in a little bit. For now, what I think is so amazing is what makes Desmond stand out is his commitment to convictions. He had a commitment to his convictions. And we all have convictions. 
we all have convictions about different things. For some people, it's like, I'm going to be the best gentleman I can be. I, or, or for some people, it's like, my work ethic is just like so strong. Uh, or maybe it's like people over phones. Like you just have different things that you have convictions of that's like, I don't know if everyone else thinks this way, but this is just how I feel. Right. And I feel like this is what I need to do or, or what I need to believe or whatever it might be. And so we all have convictions. I mean, the, but the difference is uh, when you have convictions, what makes it a real conviction is if you actually commit to it. Will you stick to the convic convictions you have? Because sometimes they're going to get tested and tried. I had a conviction in uh, when I was a teenager that I was never going to drink. I was like, I'm just never going to drink. And so that got tested by people who didn't like that or were bothered by it or even friends, friends who would try and trick me into doing it. I have not, they did not win. But the point is, ooh, I had to stay committed. Or even when I was like, you know what? I'm gonna stay a virgin until I'm married. Oh, Jesus, thank you for the help. Oh, commitment is hard with that. But I even got a shirt made, virgin and proud of it. It was this big yellow shirt. I'm not lying. I tried to find the picture. I couldn't find it. But a big yellow shirt, like big virgin and proud of it. And I would wear it to West Edmonton Mall and just walk down the thing and just watch people's reactions. And, like, I, and, and it would be like guys or girls. It would be people just like, just like, are you kidding me? Or people are like, like burst out laughing at me. Or people that were just like, what is happening? Like, <laughs> but when you have a commitment to your convictions, people notice it and you have to make the choice. I'm going to stand by it. But personal convictions, whatever they might be, that's not enough on their own. Because the thing is, personal convictions, there's more to it than that. And Desmond, the reason Desmond was in this war was because somebody else had a personal conviction that they based their whole life on that they stood by. And that man's name was Adolf Hitler. He had a very firm conviction and belief in what he was doing. So the difference for us, and what I want to talk about today when I talk about convictions is, are your convictions based on faith, on the word of God? Are they based in God's truths? Those are the convictions that God has planted inside of us to do something with. And that's what I want to talk about today. Convictions that look beyond ourselves and don't just see the, see the world the way it is. We look at it the way God sees it. We look past the color of skin. Charlottesville, anyone, right? People with very messed up convictions, acting on their convictions in very terrible ways. But God is saying, hey, when you have convictions planted in the word of God, in my truth, do something with it and watch what happens. And as Christ followers, we are driven by conviction, even if the world doesn't always understand or agree with uh, what we stand for. And in this next clip, Desmond has been put through a lot already. He's, he's coming to basic training and the fellow soldiers are beating him up, mocking him. Like they just, you saw a bit of that there. Uh, commanding officers, just telling him to quit. It's like, D what are you doing? Like, get out of here. And he's just at all this pressure to walk away. In fact, it gets to the point where because he won't touch a gun, even when he's ordered to, um, he's thrown into prison and now he's put on trial. And let's take a look at what happens. Your Honor, Private Doss waves his morality at us like it's some kind of badge of honor. He flaunts his contempt by directly disobeying a series of direct orders from his commanding officer. Why is it so important to you, given your refusal to even touch a weapon, to serve in a combat unit? It isn't right that other men should fight and die, that I would just be sitting at home safe. I need to serve. I got the energy and the passion to serve as a medic. Right in the middle with the other guys, no less danger, just while everybody else is taking life, I'm gonna be saving it. With the world so set on tearing itself apart, it doesn't seem like such a bad thing to me to want to put a little bit of it back together. Private Doss, you are free to run into the hellfire of battle without a single weapon to protect yourself. So in the midst of all his convictions, he just holds on puts up with whatever comes his way and says, I have to stand my ground on this. This is who I am. This is what I need to do. And I believe God's put this in me for a reason, even though sometimes it didn't feel like there was a good reason <laughs> and people were coming against him. And it gets to the place where he is allowed to head into battle, which is what he does. This is a true story, guys. This is so crazy. 
If you haven't seen this movie, or, and, and man, they put even so much, they couldn't even put all the things yeah. he did into this movie because he, he's amazing and it's, a, it's an incredible story. Um, we have these convictions for a reason. God doesn't give us convictions so that we can just type on Facebook and say, look how good we are. I believe this and I'm amazing. No, we have convictions so that we can act on them. That is what God wants. And I believe that God is gearing us, us individually, us as a church. He's gearing us for battle. He's preparing us for battle in a world that needs it. And in Ephesians 6, Paul, one of the amazing founders of the church that just kept uh, building and, and, and drawing people in, he's talking to the church in Ephesus and he's been sharing all these insights and just speaking life into them. And then he wraps it up with this. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, draw your strength and might from God. Put on the full armor of God. Why else would you need to put armor on? <laughs> to protect yourselves from the devil and his evil schemes. We're not waging war against enemies of flesh and blood alone. No, this fight is against tyrants, against authorities, against supernatural powers and demon, pr I love the language in this, demon princes that slither in the darkness of this world and against wicked spiritual armies that lurk about in heavenly places. Paul is painting this very dark and deep picture of this is our world, guys. Let's not kid ourselves. There is a world full of darkness and supernatural stuff that is going on. We might not see it on the surface, but it's there. It's happening in everyone's lives. And we need to equip ourselves to head into battle. This is Paul's charge to, to the church. We got to head in to the battle. There is an enemy that wants to rob our world of a connection with Jesus. That is his goal. Just to do whatever he can to prevent you from connecting to Jesus. And there is something yet inside of us in the midst of that that says, it isn't right that I should just be sitting at home safe. I need to serve. There's a conviction in us that says, this isn't right to see what's happening and what's happened in my life or what's happening in these other people's lives. It's not right. And I feel like I need to do something about it. Even if you don't know what that is, the conviction's still there. A conviction that says, while everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving life. When everyone else is, is uh, tweeting or putting whatever they want about, you know, mocking someone else or tearing someone else down, I'm going to speak life into a situation. When this is happening over here and everybody's got this negative approach, I'm going to turn the other way and do something completely different. I'm going to be light where there's way too much dark. And we as a church enter that battlefield every day. Every day we walk out these doors after a Sunday or whenever and we head out into our world where there is a very real battlefield where God is calling us to go and do something with these convictions that we have inside of us. And think about conviction. Conviction can be anything. It can be something that excites you. It's just like, I really want to see God, this happen. I think this is a good thing. It might be something that really pisses you off. Like, it's just like something in the world. It's like, I hate that this happens. Maybe you're part of the solution. And maybe you don't know what that is yet, but when you just start to follow God, I'm going to put on my armor, I'm going to head in, God, you better know what, yeah. you know what I need to do, just point me in the right direction, God. Yeah, that's, right. that's what he wants. And it's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a daily commitment to represent Christ in our speech, in our actions, in everything that we're doing. And I know that that costs us. It costs us time, it costs us energy, it costs us focus. But if you ever get to a place where you feel like, I don't know, like I've been doing this, JD, I've been doing this. I've been at my workplace or in my family or whatever it is. I am trying to point people to Jesus. I'm trying to get out there on the battlefield and I don't know if I've got anything left. If you feel like you get to a place like that, then, well, watch this clip. That's our objective, Axel Ridge. Oh. 
What is it you want of me? I don't understand. I can't hear you. So Doss's friends, fellow soldiers, are dead, missing. Everything has fallen apart. They've been trying to take the ridge, trying to claim ground, and they are failing. It's everybody's retreating, falling back. They have had massive casualties. And he's at a place where it's just like, he's exhausted. He's watching friends die. He feels defeated. And I'm sure in the inside, he's screaming, I'm done sitting on the edge of that ridge. How many of us have ever said to ourselves, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm done with trying to reach out to that family member. I try and, try and show them love or whatever. And I, all I get is just backlash and it, it's just getting worse. I'm done. Man, I'm done with that, that person that I'm trying to connect with. I feel like I need to speak into their lives because I know they've got stuff going on, but they're just, there's just so much resistance and so much stuff. I'm done. I can't handle it, man. It's such, such a situation. You know, maybe it's saying I'm done being a positive example at my workplace. All I get is harassed for it. I try so hard and all I get is harassed. I feel done. And in the silence, maybe you've said the same thing that Desmond said to God. What do you want of me? I don't understand. I can't hear you. Such a desperate cry out to God. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. God, what do you want with me? And in the midst of that, him asking that question, the response is hearing the cries of the wounded, of the hurting out there back on the battlefield. And in that moment, he answers the call, answers the cry and says, all right. I love that. I love that. It's just like, God, talk to me, talk to me. And then we hear this. Yeah, so no, no, I, 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 go away. Quit bugging me about stuff. No, God, talk to me. God, talk to me. God, talk to me. Hey, this person's trying to talk to you. Hey, this person's trying to connect with you. This person's, they said something that just like, ooh, why did they say that? Uh, shh, shh, I'm trying to talk to God. I'm trying to hear God. God wants to speak to us through the cries of a broken, desperate, hurting world. And we need to hear the cries. We need to hear the cries. And the cries, they're not always super obvious. It's not like you're going to go to your workplace or school or wherever this week and somebody's just going to be like, does anyone here believe in Jesus? Is there any Christians that can come talk to me? I need help. Yeah. <laughs> that is not going to be the cry you hear this week. The cry is going to be the family member who wants to make sure everybody knows how perfect their life is. Yeah. Look how perfect my life is. I have everything together. I have got it so good. I'm so great. In the midst of that, can you hear the insecurity? Yeah. The real cry that says, I don't have it all together and I need somebody to help because I'm in way too deep. I've painted too big of a picture of perfection that I can't hold up and it is overwhelming me. It's the friend that's pushing themselves too hard to be successful, too hard. It's all I got to do is this, 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 to hear the cry in the midst of it that, ah, I feel like all the weight's on my own shoulders. Hey, did you know that someone else wants to carry that weight for you? Maybe it's the cry of a coworker who wants to hang out and it seems simple. It seems like just a hangout, but maybe there's something more there. Maybe what they're trying to say is, I want what you got, but I don't even know what you've got or how to get it. Can we hang out? <laughs> there could be something there. Can we hear the cries? If we're truly listening, we're far more likely to hear God's voice through those cries. So who are the people in your life that are crying out for help? In your world this week, when you walk out these doors, who are the people, whether they're subtle or obvious cries, 
And what do they need rescuing from? Is it emptiness or addiction struggles or relationship problems or performance issues or depression or anxiety, whatever it is? God's saying, hey, gear up. You're part of the solution. I put them in your world for a reason. I brought that to your attention. You know, when you just notice something, it's like, oh, why did they say that? That was a weird response. Don't just brush that off. That could be God saying, hey, that was for you. You heard that when no one else picked up on what just happened. That was a God moment. You need to act on it. Talk to that person about it or, or do something that's gonna change that perspective they have, whatever it might be. And it's not just friends or family either. You know, Desmond Doss actually saved quite a few Japanese soldiers as well, which is crazy. He just, his motto, and they, he says this in an interview that they did with him. He's like, I just wanted to save everyone because everyone deserves to live. And so he had this perspective that I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are my enemy in my life, in my world, at my workplace, whatever. Everyone is worth saving. Everyone needs to experience Jesus and I will do what I can to help them get there. Romans 10 says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one who they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Think about this. If you are on the battlefield at Okinawa, top of Hacksaw Ridge, and you are hurt, you are wounded, you are, you're like, I'm gonna die out here. It's just a matter of time. And suddenly over the crest, you see Desmond Doss, you know, avoiding artillery fire heading your direction. And he grabs you and starts dragging you back. Don't tell me you wouldn't be like, oh, the beautiful feet that you have, that you came to me. Oh, your feet are so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news to people that need to hear it. There are people that will thank you for sharing with them the power of what God can do or just giving them a different perspective than what they have. That is what we need to do. And it is a privilege and an honor to be chosen by God to bring people out of their mess and into relationship with Jesus. And can you save everybody? No. But you can accomplish more than you imagine if you simply embrace the same philosophy that Desmond did, as we're gonna see in this next clip. We're at the end, Jerry. Just sit tight, okay? Son of a gun, this is gonna work. You now, Eric. You have to trust me now, Eric. You don't have to trust me. Dad! Hold on, one of ours, hold on! Let's go, let's go! Come on, I got you. I got you. I got you. Come on, I got you. You're okay. You're okay. We got you. We got you. One 
one more. Help me get one more. Desmond Doss <clears throat> saved 75 men that night. This really happened. Wow. Went back out when everyone else had retreated and found 75 different people one at a time, dragged them back, lowered them down, and kept going for more. And the whole time, he just kept saying, please, Lord, help me get one more. One at a time. Who's the next person? Got him. Please, Lord, help me get one more. One more. If you look at Jesus' ministry, his primary focus was not crowds. He spoke to crowds. He did lots with crowds, but he was focused on the one. He was focused on the one person that he could heal, do something incredible for, speak life into, just, just be there for him, whatever it was, one after another after another, one at a time, one, then another one, then another one. And this is how we need to look at our world. Not overwhelming, say, I can't change my workplace. I can't change all this. Who am I to do that? No, no, no. One at a time. What is the one conversation that you can have? What is the one thing you can do? What is the one action this week that is gonna stir something in a person to point them towards Jesus? And once you've done that, who's the next person? And I'm not talking numbers like once, it's like, ah, I checked you off my list. No. We're drawing people in. We're bringing them to a place where now they are connected to Jesus. They're growing and flourishing. Great. You're doing good. Awesome. We'll touch base, but I'm going to go get one more. I'm going to go get one more and bring them into the world that they are meant to be in. And many of you here are here today. Here's the thing you need to know. Many of you are the one more. You are here because somebody got up, brushed themselves off, and walked back into their world, into the workplace that you work at, at wherever it is, and they said, there's one more out there that I could tell about Jesus or point them towards Jesus. And you might be here because you are the one more. And we are a church of one more. This is who we are. We will just, we will never be too full, people. <laughs> we will never, we will never be good enough. It's like, mm, you know what? I think we're good enough now. That will never happen because there's already always one more person that needs Jesus. One more person that needs to discover what true family should look like. That is why we do what we do. And Desmond didn't get up and say, I'm going to go save 75 people. He just said, I'm going to find one. And after that, I'm going to find another. And every time he did, he just kept asking for strength to find the one more. And God would give him the strength to go back into enemy territory the entire night, dragging people back. You got to realize, like, I'm fully convinced God's hand was on him the whole time. In fact, I'll get, you got to hear this. Uh, veteran Carl Bentley said this, uh, at, he, who was also at Hacksaw Ridge. He said, it was as if God had his hand on Doss's shoulder. It's the only explanation I can give for how he was able to get through all of that, pull those people back. And get this, uh, in an interview following the war, a Japanese soldier is reported to say, he said this, he said, he remembers seeing Doss lowering someone over the side and every time he got him in his sights and pulled the trigger, the gun jammed. Wow. Wow. Every time. Went, went on to continue and fight others, but any, in that moment, every single time, I got a shot, couldn't take it. God's hand is on us as we are in the battlefield. And that doesn't mean that you're not gonna take some hits. We're still gonna take some hits, people. There's gonna be times where you gotta brush off the offense of what someone did when you, when you were trying to invest in them and say, you know what, you don't stop me. Offense isn't gonna stop me or this situation's not gonna stop me from getting back up and going back out and doing what I have to do. You got to hear this. Okay, I got to show you this. So this, this is an actual military report of what, uh, after the, that night of Hacksaw Ridge, of what Desmond Doss did. Listen to this. On the 21st of May, in a night attack on high ground near Shuri, he remained in exposed territory while the rest of his company took cover, fearlessly risking the chance that he would be mistaken for an infiltrating Japanese and giving aid to the injured until he was himself seriously wounded in the legs by an explosion of a grenade. Rather than call another aid man from cover, he cared for his own injuries and waited five hours before litter bearers reached him and started carrying him to cover. The trio was caught in an enemy tank attack and Private First Class Doss, seeing a more critically wounded man nearby, crawled off the litter and directed the bearers to give their first attention to the other man. Awaiting the litter bearers' return, he was once again struck 
This really happened. This time suffering a compound fracture of one arm with magnificent fortitude, he bound a rifle stock to his shattered arm as a splint and then crawled 300 yards over rough terrain to the aid station. Through his outstanding bravery and unflinching determination in the face of desperately dangerous conditions, Private First Class Doss saved the lives of many soldiers. His name became a symbol throughout the 77th Infantry Division for outstanding gallantry far and above and beyond the call of duty. This is just one man. He's no more special than you or me. He just had a faith and a conviction that wouldn't let him stop. And he, he sought God. And he kept asking, God, what do you want from me? Whether I can hear you or not right now, God, what do you want? Okay, I'll head back in. This church answers the call of duty. This is what we do. We don't watch people from a distance. We get into the mess. This is what we do. It's who we are. We get into the mess of people's lives because we know what God's done in our lives. How can we not respond by helping others discover the same thing that we have? Who are we to keep that to ourselves? It's like, thanks, God, you saved my life. All those other people, ah, no. How can we not want the same thing for the people in our world, our family members or coworkers or anyone that we know that's a part of our world? And if we take some hits along the way, that's okay. We're protected and we know where our strength comes from. Take a look at this last clip. Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Where does our hope, where does our strength come from? The Lord is our strength. And when we have him as our strength, we don't have to grow tired or weary. And if you're feeling that way, even in situations where it's like, man, I've tried, I've tried with my family or coworkers, whatever, I, I've, I don't even know the right words. I'm not super good at this stuff. I don't know how to show it or say it or whatever. When you place your hope in God, he will renew your strength. And it says that you will soar and not stumble. So instead of stumbling through and be like, oh man, I should probably tell people about Jesus. Uh, blah, 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 we stumble. no. When you put your hope in God and say, God, in every, when I go to work tomorrow, just give me the opportunity. Help me to see the opportunity because there's always one. Give me the words to say, Holy Spirit. Help me to know what to do. Walk me through. I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to start the conversation even if I don't know what's, what's about to happen, knowing that I can soar through this because my hope is in, the God, is in the God who gives me everything I need and gives me the strength I need. That is our hope. Imagine a church full of people who didn't retreat from the situations, who didn't retreat into themselves or get caught up in a little church bubble, but answered the cry. Took the time to actually say, God, who are the people in my world that are crying out that you want me to do something for? God, how can I draw people to you? I don't have all the answers. I'm not the most fluent speaker. I make a lot of mistakes myself but you can still use me, God. What do I do? Imagine a church that all of us just went out this week. We walk out these doors into our Monday mornings. And who knows what this next week could be like. God has given you everything you need. You are equipped to head into battle. And there are people waiting for you, waiting for you that you, it will surprise you when you start the conversation or you do that certain thing. And they're just like, I needed that. Wow, I did not think that was gonna happen, but God can do anything. And you might say, world, you might not understand my motives or my beliefs or my convictions, but I got to stand by them. If that means confusion or isolation or even rejection, so be it. Because my convictions compel me to action. My convictions compel me to something more. And I'm going to answer the cry because it's the same cry that I cried when I was on the battlefield. 
And God, you sent someone to save me and bring me back into relationship with you. And I see where I am now. So how can I not do the same thing? Can we stand? As we wrap up today, I hope that, you know, it's not just motivating words or anything else, but that God is doing something fresh and anew in our church and, in, and as individuals that just, we just got to take this to the next level and just say, God, I'm going to trust you more than I ever have to walk back into this, whether I've been doing good at this or not. It's not about performance. It's just trust and response. I'm responding to you, God, and I'm going to help others experience you too. This is what God wants for us. And when we have this, when we live, man, when we live from this place of strength, we are fueled by God's love. And you're going to have the confidence and determination to head back in to that battlefield with the same mantra that says, please, Lord, help me get one more, one more, one more. We're going to pray today. And I want to invite you to join us as we pray, because here's the thing. Each of us have been born with a terminal condition called sin. <laughs> this is our world. This is who we are. And only Jesus can bring us out of that. He uses people to get us off the battlefield into his presence and in, where he can do good things. But he's the only one who can treat the wounds, save us, actually make the difference. And if you're here and you haven't, you, maybe you know you're on a battlefield, whether it's super messy or not, and you've polished it up real nice and nobody can tell you're on a battlefield. You recognize that, that man, I'm empty or I'm, I'm hurting in this way or I don't know how to get over this. And Jesus is the freedom that you need, that all of us need. And he is here right now offering his hand saying, let me help you. Let me pick you up. Let me get you to a better place. He's already won the victory. And so we are gonna pray. And I wanna invite you to join with us as we pray and say, Jesus, thank you that you have got the victory. You paid the ultimate price to remove the power of sin. And so I walk into relationship with you. I say yes to you, Jesus. I want to follow you. I give my life to you. I place my trust in you. Forgive me of my sins. Clean up the mess of my life. Thank you for pulling me off the battlefield. And now, Jesus, I want to respond to you by getting up and heading back into that field. God, use me to reach others and help bring them to you. In Jesus' name, by your strength, amen. Amen. God is doing good things. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. And we look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.